A potential hostile encounter with China now dominates the United States military planning, and vice versa. What would a war look like? Who would win? Before we get to that, let's take a minute to explain why our military experts have decided to discuss this potentially very real and, quite frankly, terrifying scenario. After the end of World War II and especially the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the United States emerged as the world's preeminent power, supreme in military, economic, technological, and even cultural influence. After 1991, the United States was so strong that some experts believed it had transcended superpower status. According to their theory, it had instead ascended into a hyperpower, a state that dominates all other states in every domain in the international system. The world had become a unipolar one, even leading some observers in the 1990s and part of the 2000s, most famously Francis Fukuyama, to declare an end of history and the final triumph of liberal democracy as the last form of human political organization. However, the 2000s and 2010s threw some cold water on this theory. Costly American military expeditions in the Middle East, the 2008 financial crisis, Russia's expansionist ambitions under Vladimir Putin, Iran and North Korea's nuclear programs, and above all, the economic and military rise of China, all undermine the notion of unipolarity. By the middle of the 2010s, the Pentagon proposed its third offset strategy, which tacitly acknowledged that the unipolar moment was, if not over, at least under threat by the emerging coalition of authoritarian powers, led by China, who were opposed to the international order led by the United States. The United States was therefore shifting its military posture away from the counterterrorism and counterinsurgency campaigns which dominated its strategy following 9-11, when the unipolar moment was near its height, and toward competition with and deterrence of other states, especially China. This is why the US is currently heavily oriented toward preparing for a potential adversarial encounter with China. Let's dive into what kind of conflict might unfold and which side could emerge victorious. We can begin with a comparison of the size of the two forces. With 1.4 billion people, China is the second most populous country in the world, having been surpassed by India in April 2023. It has the world's largest military with almost 2.2 million active personnel. The United States military ranks third in size with almost 1.4 million active duty personnel. When adding in reservists, the numbers increase to 3.35 million and 2.2 million, respectively. China also has the world's largest navy, with 425 fleet units in its active naval inventory as of August 21, 2023. This number excludes smaller patrol ships and other auxiliaries, presumably its huge fishing fleet that has acted as a de facto maritime militia in disputed waters. Meanwhile, the United States has 243 units in its active naval inventory, excluding smaller patrol ships and other auxiliaries. The United States has the world's largest air force, with 5,217 active aircraft as of 2022. China ranks a distant third, with 1,991. When counting the total number of military aircraft with all branches combined, China's numerical disadvantage in the skies becomes more pronounced, as the United States has 13,247 aircraft among all of its military branches while China ranks a very distant third again at 3,285. When it comes to air power at sea, the United States has 2,464 aircraft, while China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, has only 437. This is an important distinction and reveals that many of China's advantages are only surface deep. The numerical difference in the makeup of the two forces is important. A war between the United States and China would take place in the area close to the Chinese mainland, in the territory around the first island chain, a string of countries that stretch from Japan to Indonesia. China would be able to concentrate all of its resources there, and its supply lines would be much shorter. In contrast, the United States has global commitments, with Russia exerting pressure on Eastern Europe, Iran and its allies in the Middle East, and North Korea on the Korean Peninsula. All of these hotspots demand America's attention, the United States would also need to ship its supplies and replacements across the Pacific. These supply lines would be long and vulnerable to attack, the tyranny of distance. The United States has qualitative advantages, however. China's army has not seen major combat operations in almost half a century. The last time was the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, where the PLA had a poor showing indeed, 
against the Vietnamese. In contrast, the United States military has had decades of combat experience and a buildup of institutional knowledge that the PLA simply does not have. It has more experienced soldiers, sailors, marines, and officers. The Chinese military has engaged in a large buildup and conducted extensive drills and war games with partners such as Russia, but there is no substitute for the real thing. Russia's poor performance in Ukraine shows that, and its armed forces had more experience than China's currently does. The United States Air Force not only has numerical superiority over the People's Liberation Army Air Force, but a qualitative advantage in those planes. Although it may not seem this way at first, China has one fifth-generation fighter jet, the Chengdu J-20. China may have over 200 of these in service, a number which could hit as high as 1,000 by 2030 if current production rates continue. It may also have over 240 of the advanced fourth-generation plus J-16 fighters in service. This is a formidable force for the PLAAF. In contrast, the United States has only built 187 of its best fifth-generation fighter jets, the F-22 Raptor. The last one was delivered in 2012, and the Air Force has no plans to order any more. However, the United States can supplement the extremely high-quality Raptor with the fifth-generation F-35 Lightning II. Over 960 F-35s have been delivered as of August 2023. The United States also has thousands of advanced fourth-generation fighter jets like the F-15 Eagle, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-18 Super Hornet available. And all of them come with better trained and more experienced pilots than their Chinese counterparts. Although China has closed the gap, the United States is still supreme in the world's skies, and in an all-out air battle, the Americans would eventually establish air superiority. The war at sea is also not favorable to China. The People's Liberation Army Navy may have a bigger fleet in terms of sheer numbers, but the United States Navy has purposely chosen to pursue a different strategy than its Chinese counterpart. Numbers aren't everything. Many of the Chinese vessels are small and would prove relatively poor in a military confrontation. In contrast, the USN operates sturdier, more powerful vessels. For example, the PLAN has three aircraft carriers, only one of which uses a modern catapult system. The USN has 11, all of which are more modern than the first two Chinese carriers. China has plans to make more aircraft carriers in the years to come, but as of now, the United States has a significant advantage. Additionally, China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators. The PLAN is trying its best to catch up, but it's still far short. As a conflict between the United States and China would mainly be fought in the seas and skies around the first island chain, with comparatively limited land operations, the traditional balance of power should favor the United States in a head-to-head -head confrontation. However, China has recognized this and has adapted with a strategy of anti-access area denial, A2AD. One of the things that marked the United States' emergence as a supposed hyperpower following the end of the Cold War was its ability to project power anywhere on the globe within hours. Perhaps one of the best examples was the Navy SEAL raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in 2011. This complicated military operation occurred without the Pakistani government's knowledge, and there was little that Pakistan could do about it except raise a protest afterward. After the end of the Cold War, the United States had no peer competitor in the international system, which could prevent it from using its military resources in the way it wanted. However, this began to change with China's military buildup. China's A2AD strategy sounds complicated, but it's relatively simple. First, it is to deny its adversaries freedom of movement in the disputed region, anti-access. To do this, it will utilize certain assets, especially cheap precision ballistic and cruise missiles, to destroy key targets in offensive strikes. The second leg of the strategy is to use defensive systems to deny the enemy the ability to operate in territory controlled by it or other friendly powers. For example, China would try to use its stockpile of thousands of cheap ballistic missiles to destroy expensive American ships, especially aircraft carriers, bases, and long supply lines to prevent the United States from moving into disputed regions like the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait. Cheap ballistic missiles destroying expensive carrier groups would not only prove deadly and costly, it would prevent the United States from being able to project its power into the first island chain and the Chinese interior. This is the opposite of what happened during the third Taiwan Strait crisis in 1995-96, when the United States sent two carrier groups to the area, 
the Chinese did not have the resources to deal with this projection of American power and had to back down. The story would be very different today and the move far more dangerous on the part of the United States. Chinese air and missile attacks on US naval assets, supply lines, and bases in Japan, South Korea, and even as far out as Guam would take advantage of the tyranny of distance to prevent the United States from being able to fight the war for the long haul. The United States might be able to establish air and naval superiority with its higher quality planes and ships in a confrontation, but it could have a hard time replacing losses and bringing more resources over. Meanwhile, China would be operating close to its own territory. The supply lines would be much shorter and easier to defend with its air and sea defense systems, and all of China's resources would be concentrated here. In addition to these kinetic assets, China has tried to develop its electronic and cybernetic warfare capabilities to further disrupt the US military capability. China's military buildup and its A2 AD weapons has posed the most serious challenge to US military might since the Cold War. It is why many experts believe that the United States is slowly but steadily losing its traditional military superiority in the Indo-Pacific region. To defeat China's A2 AD strategy, the Pentagon developed its third offset strategy. China hopes that the development of advanced A2 AD capabilities will deter the United States from even disputing its expansionist moves. This is why for the Pentagon, it is important to maintain forward presence capability. It must be able to defeat the attempts to impede the movement of American military forces and surge them forward in a combat-credible posture. According to the US Army's Center for Lessons Learned, the third offset strategy involves forces that are or can rapidly get forward, survive a withering Chinese or Russian assault, and blunt the adversary's aggression. It is almost reminiscent of a boxer trying to duck and slip past a barrage of long jabs to get inside his opponent's range and deliver power blows. The United States is currently developing technologies to better prepare it to pursue this strategy. For example, these new technologies would involve better artificial intelligence to enable human officers to make faster and more informed decisions. The integration of human and unmanned platforms, like the Sea Hunter autonomous drone ship, would also be part of the third offset strategy. Other technologies like ship-borne hypersonic missiles and the Helios laser system can also be considered part of the third offset strategy, as it is hoped that the laser will add a layer of protection to the US Navy's ships from the Chinese ballistic and cruise missile threat. The laser is also ideal for countering drones. The first Helios laser began seeing service in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022, and the Navy requested $35 million in its 2023 budget for Helios systems when they will begin to become operational at sea. However, as dazzling as the third offset strategy technologies are, they are still works in progress. The United States neglected countermeasures against China's A2 AD strategy as it pursued its counterinsurgency and counterterrorism efforts in the war on terror. Under current conditions, the United States military still uses many technologies and systems that are not well designed to counter the strategy China is pursuing. China still cannot defeat the United States in a head-to-head -head military confrontation, but because of geography, it does not necessarily need to. All it needs to do is prevent the United States from projecting enough power past the first island chain to defeat its expansionist ambitions. As part of its strategy, American military bases in Japan would be targeted in the opening shots of the war, to destroy troops and equipment, prevent the stockpiling of supplies, and disrupt the United States' strategy in the region Air defense systems would take down some of the incoming missiles, but China has thousands in its arsenal, and its attacks would certainly do a great deal of damage. War games done at the Pentagon and defense think tanks have repeatedly confirmed these disadvantages. In a January 2023 scenario run by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the United States, with the help of Japan and Taiwan, defeated an amphibious invasion of Taiwan, but the casualties were enormous, with losses in dozens of ships hundreds of aircraft, and tens of thousands of military personnel, with the US position on the international stage undermined for years afterward. China suffered heavily too, however CSIS warned that deterrence needed to be strengthened immediately. Other war games were even less kind. A 2020 war game run by the Pentagon over Taiwan and other scenarios had the United States failing miserably because gathering ships, aircraft, and other forces in a way that would let them reinforce one another made them sitting ducks for Chinese missile attacks. To make matters worse, the United States lost access to its electronic networks from the get-go. 
upending the information dominance strategy it has used so successfully starting in the Gulf War. In response to the 2020 war game, the Pentagon is looking to shore up its contested logistics, possibly through the use of rockets to fly above the war zone. It's also looking to find ways to aggregate power virtually rather than physically. Then Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General John Hyten said of it, you have to aggregate the mass fires, but it doesn't have to be a physical aggregation. It could be a virtual aggregation for multiple domains. Acting at the same time under a single command structure allows the fire to come in on anybody. It allows you to disaggregate to survive. He admitted this was exceedingly difficult to do, however. Finally, the United States would need to improve the defense of its networks against hackers with a hacker-proof combat cloud. For now, though, these things are only speculation. What is not, however, is the United States' advantage in submarine warfare. China's missile capability has made it increasingly dangerous for the United States and its allies to project power behind the first island chain with surface ships, but the submarine force is much better protected. That's why China raised such a big protest about the AUKUS deal that would give Australia nuclear-powered submarines. Submarines are ideal for the implementation of the United States' third offset strategy. American nuclear-powered submarines can operate for months. They are quiet and dive deep, making them difficult to detect. They can also launch conventional or nuclear-armed ballistic or cruise missiles to strike sensitive targets. The United States submarine fleet would make any invasion of Taiwan or other amphibious operations in the First Island chain a costly proposition for the Chinese military. The presence of these submarines also gives the United States significant conventional or nuclear first strike options to attack targets on land, such as Chinese military installations, which house the ballistic missiles that are such a threat to surface ships and land bases. China's PLAN is trying to close the submarine gap. At the moment, though, the bulk of its underwater fleet consists of diesel-electric submarines. They are quieter than nuclear submarines when running on electric power, but most surface to charge their batteries and are much louder when running on diesel power during this process. As of March 2023, China has a fleet of 56 submarines, but only six of them are nuclear-powered. The disparity means that the United States can carry out stealthier and longer operations under the water than China's navy can. If a war did break out between the United States and China, the US submarine fleet would swing into action and attack Chinese naval assets, land bases, and shipping. The latter is especially important and reveals the United States' ace in the hole. China depends heavily on foreign food and energy imports. From its perspective, China's attempt to expand its influence in the South China Sea can be seen as an act of self-preservation. Critical shipping routes worth trillions of dollars go through these waters. Whoever controls them not only controls those dollars, but the ability for the countries in the area to access the resources. If China succeeds in closing the South China Sea shipping lanes, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and other American allies in the region would have a far harder time importing the resources they need. The same principle applies with China, however. A blockade of strategic shipping lanes such as the Strait of Malacca and the Strait of Luzon would cripple the commerce China depends on that comes through these straits, and much of its commerce is vital for its basic needs. While some of the Chinese missiles can reach that far, the assets being used to enforce the blockade would be better protected by distance and have more time to react to an attack. China is testing hypersonic missiles and is regarded as being ahead of the United States in the race for these weapons that would help its offensive reach. However, they are not ready for prime time and have not been widely deployed in the Chinese military yet. China would also greatly risk its naval and air assets in an attempt to disrupt the blockade. It would be the type of head-on confrontation with the United States Navy and Air Force that would put the Chinese military at a disadvantage. China may be the world's largest manufacturing nation, but it is still unable to feed or fuel itself, while the United States can. This would be the ultimate disadvantage in a wartime scenario, reminiscent of Germany's geographical disadvantages in World War I, when the Allied blockade deprived Germany of resources and slowly strangled it into starvation and submission. In a full-scale war, the United States would attempt a similar strategy. While China's missiles would ensure that the United States could not pull off a blockade in the same way the Royal Navy did in World War I, China would still be hard-pressed to break through it. So while the United States would be in danger in a confrontation in an area like the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, it would not necessarily need to go there until China is steadily worn down by the blockade and attrition. 
The United States still has a military advantage over China, but China is trying its best to close that gap. With its population starting to decline and economic growth slowing down, the dangers of a war breaking out in the Indo-Pacific may be increasing, since the Chinese Communist leadership may begin to feel like its window of opportunity to remake the order in the region is closing. Regardless of how it would be fought, a war between the United States and China, even if contained, would be bloody and come at a huge price tag. Deterrence and diplomacy are more vital than ever. But what do you think? Who would have the advantage? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.